Hello and welcome to our year-ending predictions panel in Apps and Ops. Today we're going to be talking about a number of topics that surround um, the applications that you use in your enterprise, um, custom or not, um, and the operations that that both helps with um, and then sometimes can hurt. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Christy Campbell from Cirrus Insight and Kevin Raybon from SOPSA. Kevin, could you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Kevin Raybon. I run an organization that's focused on revenue and sales operations leaders. We um, are found at SOPSA.org. And then my background includes uh, running sales operations for like the last 15 years, either as that one man show or all the way up to a team of 65. So um, glad to be here today and uh, look forward to participating. Fantastic. Significant background in the sales ops area. I'm really happy to have you and your predictions for the year of joining us here. Christy? Uh, my name is Christy Campbell. I've been a Salesforce admin for over a decade now and uh, an MVP for the past six years. And uh, I joined Cirrus Insight this year as their internal admin. So if you're not familiar with Cirrus, it's automating uh, your email and calendar items directly into the standard objects in Salesforce. So really saving time and reducing manual data entry, which uh, as an admin makes me happy and makes my users happy. They get to live in their email where they like to be. So uh, thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thanks for being here to both of you. Um, really looking forward to the session. My name is Sean Allen. I'm in charge of marketing um, at Squid. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Squid operates in a world where um, what you need to do um, is bring new and interesting custom experiences to your users, whether they be employees, customers, partners, suppliers, um, and do it in a way where we are focused on solving the problem and then focusing on how we go about um, implementing that. But um, I want to go through a couple of housekeeping items on um, as we get into the show here, which is um, if you have any questions for either of the panelists, um, I'm just kind of moderating um, the overall show here. Um, please feel free to ask those in the chat and we'll get to them um, as uh, as time permits and as uh, as close to the topic as we're covering um, as we can do. And stick around towards the end because we've got some giveaways um, for those uh, for those that are um, that are still with us. So. Without further ado, let's jump right into it and get to the meat of um, the reason that we're all here together. Um, and first, a hearty happy holidays to everybody that's uh, that's joining us today. So, um, Christy, let's start with you. On the Serious Insight podcast recently, you discussed this idea of redefining the term admin. Why do you think there's a need for or, or this is the time for that change? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, as I mentioned, I've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, when I started, there was no chatter there was no trailhead, right? There, the product has expanded and uh, through acquisition, through development, you know, these releases three times a year. And uh, I just don't know that that concept that people have of what an admin does has expanded um, at the same rate. So, you know, uh, back in my day, uh, I, I'm an accidental admin. I think there was a lot more of that of, hey, you do this thing kind of adjacent, right? Or I started questioning process and became an admin. Um, versus now you do have these resources, you do have these intentional admins that are uh, maybe even switching jobs and looking for something new and finding Salesforce. And so um, I coined the term admin developer um, really uh, to help change the, my own perception that um, I, I'm more than just an admin, right? I Especially after this long um, and, and with thinking about more advanced items, um, really the capability that admins can be architects. Um, I'm sorry. And I said admin developer, which is one way to go. I think of it as an admin tech, right? That it's um, not just developers that can become architects. And we're starting to look at, you know, advanced flows and integrations and a lot more um, than just creating users or kind of the standard things that people think of as administrative tasks. So really, I think, um, you know, as the the uh, platform has grown, uh, we really just kind of need to grow up the, the mentality of what admins do and cover, which they're probably already doing potentially, especially depending on the size of your org as a solo admin, right? There's a lot of hats I'm wearing all day long and just trying to get people to realize that that role is a lot more than people might think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Lines are blurring. 
the roles are blurring um, as the responsibilities just balloon um, over time as the underlying platform continues to expand. So Kevin, speaking of change, we've seen an insane amount of movement in the sales ops area over the past couple of years. What sticks out to you? Well, what sticks out to me is tangent to what Christy talked about, which is we, many of us that started in sales ops, we were accidental um, sales ops people as well, because we came into sales ops because generally we were people who could be relied on, get stuff done. Um, and we started with a very specific um, remit, these very specific things that we were going to do. But now that sales ops is growing in, in popularity and rev ops is expanding the view of it, we have this need for more and more people to, to improve and grow their understanding of the go-to-market functions and processes of the business and how they fit in. So the, the talent needs that we've got in sales ops and rev ops are growing. And it's really important that, that we you know, help people chart their path um, up the up the ladder, so to speak. So we become more strategic. Um, and some of that comes down to even just learning how to talk about what it is that you do. If, if you see yourself as someone who pulls reports every Thursday for a certain audience, you need to really evaluate, well, why are you pulling those reports? So when you talk to talk to people about what you do, you can say things like, well, I help us make the most of this expensive resource that we have called sales. I help us get more efficient and more effective with the sales team. And I do that through automation. I do that through business process improvement. And I do that through helping to provide um, pure KPIs that we can measure. Right. And so the, the growth in, in, the, in the function and the, the needs that we have for talent um, are, are real. And just like Christy said, you've got, people who started off in Salesforce configuring things and then running reports. And then the business starts to change. You know, the, the average half-life of a sales leader is somewhere around 19 to 23 months right now. And every time we get a new sales leader coming in there, they bring with them a way of operating that they want to see implemented in the tool. And so it's more and more upon the admins to, to grow into being an advisor it says, you know, here's what we have. Here's why we did it. Here's what I hear you saying. Perhaps we could approach it this way or we could reconfigure that or even, hey, we can stop doing these three things because you no longer need them. <laughs> right. And there's there's lots of change out there. And I think the biggest thing is 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 talent. And then the second thing is uh, the tools. We have this explosion of sales tools. Mm. If you look back and see what happened in the MarTech space, probably beginning about eight years ago um, and how much explosion has happened in marketing technology. We're seeing that same now ramp up in, in the sales tech space. And that's leading to lots of confusion. It's leading to lots of overlap. And um, it's um, in some cases paralyzing people because they don't know what to choose. In other cases, we are getting lobbed a lot of things that were chosen for us. And then we get to admin or run them um, and make sense of what it is that we now have in this basket of goodies that we call sales technology. So I think it's it's talent and the, and the need for the, um, expansion of business acumen and growth of the talent. And then it's making sense of the sales tech that we have. And how yeah. it integrates to Salesforce. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's definitely a broad understanding of that usage of that term too. Yeah, yeah. People definitely take liberties with that term. Yes. Yeah. I always ask when somebody says it integrates to Salesforce, I start asking very specific questions. Okay. Is this a visual integration? Is this a business process level integration? Is it a data integration? What exactly do you mean uh, by integration? Is it one way or two way? I mean, it's because I need to know how deep it is and how much control I've got over modifications to that integration. So yeah, you're right. Yep. Makes a lot of sense, right? There's um, something you um, so, something you said that was interesting to me is that the um, with all these new tools coming in, it paralyzes some, and then it is the exact opposite of that for other people. They're like, yeah, bring it in. That sounds new. That sounds good. That sounds fantastic. You know, that might get me a 0.5% increase in the number of leads that I get or the number of people that I can talk to. And it just turns into this mess, right? So I, um, it really resonated, resonated with me, both of you talking about how the positions that both of you um, um, have seen, have have run, have been a part of, have been in the community of, is there is this elevation of that role because of the realization of the importance of what's happening inside of 
those different areas because of the criticality of the technology on the back end as an enabling function for the the business need on the front end, right? And the, the smart play and the smart money is on pausing a tick, right? Because when when you have people that are in the opposite of paralysis mode, you need to be able to take all those things in and kind of be adult supervision on that conversation and say, hang on, what does integration with Salesforce mean? What does this actually do to the uh, eventual problem that we're trying to solve and kind of weave all those things together? Yeah, you're right. I mean, one of the things there is, you know, we, when, before the, before the cloud became a platform that we could pay for by every month by just swiping our credit card, Right. There were natural built in pauses to the whole consideration and ac acquisition phase. But it took us a while to bring in software and select it and and, you know, configure and implement that software and then get it up and running. And now that can happen so fast that it can it can be a problem for us because it, we can run into exactly what you talked about. We just have too much too fast and there wasn't enough consideration going into it, especially in today's world where we see. Every software company starts in a specific place, solving a certain set of problems, but over time they have to grow their revenue. So they start expanding into all these extra spaces and pretty soon something that was just a forecasting, you know, forecasting tool to help you pull in your organic forecast that you do from sales manager to sales director. Now, all of a sudden it's got all this analytics and then it's got AI now added into it. And all of a sudden we're branching out from, forecast to activity as well. But wait a minute, I already bought analytics stuff and I've already got activity management stuff. So what do I do? Well, <laughs> I mean, it brings up a really good, it brings up a good question, which is like, if I, if I just look at what we've been doing at Squid um, over the past X amount of time, we probably brought in five or six new tools into the sales tech stack over the past 12 months. And each of them do a very interesting thing and they've been additive to our overall process. But how do you how do you not get distracted by the shiny new object, right? How, how do you kind of move and vet and think about the things just like what you were talking about a second ago? One of the things is you have to have a pretty solid rule with your sales leaders that the sales ops rev ops team um, has the say over what we bring into the stack. Mm. Um, because it's so easy to have a vendor, I'll pick one that I like, I'll pick outreach, right? I like these guys, but I know that they run the same play that Salesforce did early on, which is let's go directly to the sales team, get two or three people doing a trial of this thing, get them to fall in love with it. And then they're just going to spread it throughout the organization, like, like kudzu in Alabama, right? And it works, but see, that's the problem for us is we get a thing lobbed at us that mm -hmm. we didn't really have a say so in helping to, you know, to bring in, we may have chosen the tool. However, getting surprised by something that's already, you know, people have already fallen in love with and built a new way of working around, that starts to be a challenge. So I think to answer your question, it's, it's having solid rules around technology selection and staying involved in the day-to-day -day with your sales team. So you know where those friction, the friction is, and you can be that person who says, I notice you have some friction in this part of the process. Well, here's two or three options for improving that and be the one that's proposing that. Don't be the one on your heels, yeah. right? Just responding to what people select on their own because they're going to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Christy, this, I'm sure this is a sensitive point for you, right? You, you have to deal with a lot of the after effects of shadow IT, right? The after effects of people just making a decision in a bubble, et cetera. Um, but as you, um, as you think about that and as you think about the decision between a, a build or a buy, right? Because as you're looking at all these different tools, if you go to the right people in the organization, they may have an answer that says, you know what, I can extend what we already have with the tools that we have to get what you're looking for and you don't have to buy that thing. So how do, how do you look at that in, um, in both in your day-to-day -day as well as in your roles, um, in your role talking to other folks that are in your position? Yeah, I think um, it, it, just as you mentioned, it's really important to know what you already have. Uh, again, because as Kevin mentioned, it could be that now they offer something, right, that you haven't been utilizing that could meet this need. Um, I definitely think it's important to strike a balance of the the little things that maybe can help make things that you already have work better for your users. And as Kevin mentioned, kind of staying in touch with your users and seeing where those friction points are. But um, it, it certainly can be tough if your users already love something, right, have already tried something. 
but um, I think it's also really easy to see, um, to get excited by those other features, or the, as you mentioned, the shiny new thing. And, and you really have to uh, frame it in terms of what your goals are for your organization, right? And what you're really trying, why you're trying to add this piece and not just these um, extra kind of shiny features, right? What is this actually, um, what's the KPI that this is gonna help you move toward? Um, and then again, to your point, do you build it? Do you buy it, right? I think there's um, certainly advantages to um, buying things got the people who have the passion and the excitement. And, you know, if, if you need uh, email sync, you could certainly go and rebuild it, but like, that's what we do, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but then you've also are beholden to a roadmap, you know, um, and uh, the resources that we have available. Um, but it also kind of depends on the knowledge you have on your team and the time and priorities. As Kevin mentioned, if you've got all these shiny new objects kind of coming in and you're, you're trying to stay agile, then um, maybe it does make sense to uh, add in some pieces or or start somewhere small, right? Is there something mm -hmm. I could build in the short term that meets this need for you? And then um, maybe you'll find out users don't ever use it, right? Or fill it out. And then you can kind of avoid having to have locked yourself into a contract, right? Is there somewhere mm -hmm. we can start um, that's within the skill set that we have um, but then it's on me to build it, train it, maintain it, right? So there's really um, the balance there in terms of budget. And and I think one tough piece as the admin is sometimes your recommendation doesn't win the day, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. your team has decided they need something and maybe, and, you know, as long as you've given those caveats and um, your thoughts about something, you're not always going to have it go your way, but um, you can make the best of it and, um, you know, try and, like we said, integrate it to Salesforce as much as possible. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I'm hearing a lot of commonality across the answers here, which is balance, right? Know your user, know your stack, and fundamentally know the problem that you're trying to solve, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, um, it's really easy um, to kind of see your get yourself turned into kind of being a short order cook, right? Where you've got all these user requests that are coming in. I just need this field. I just need this flow. I just need this tool. Just. I just need this thing. Very dangerous word, just. Right, exactly. Just is never just. It's just two um, fields. They're all and, required, but there's just two fields. <laughs> right, exactly. And what we end up with is um, uh, an opportunity uh, detail screen inside of Salesforce that's eight pages long. Right. It's because I just need that. I just need this. I just need that. And if you're in that short order chef or cook mentality, you're just going, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can add that. I can do that. But you have to be the adult in the room in many of these, in many of these situations. It's a build versus buy. Um, it's a, what are you trying to do? It's a, can we do it with what we've got? Do we just need to go a little bit custom? Um, like how do we actually solve the problem? instead of how do we get wrapped around this long list of requirements, right? Yeah, Sean, I'll say another thing there is you need to look for that, that approach where you can rapidly prototype something, get it into the process mm -hmm. and see if that process modification works and then, and then rapidly iterate on it before you lock it down or you have some huge list of requirements where you're going and you're buying a tool and you're integrating that tool to, for this new business this new business process, when once they get it, get the business process changed, they may not like the process that they actually described, mm -hmm. or it may not stay around given that sales leadership changes so often. Um, so, it's an interesting balance against that too, though, of you don't want to change too much all the time, right? You want your, your sales users to be able to create opportunities and have it be a pretty similar process, right? So you want to not introduce everything new and shiny all at the same time. Um, so it, it, again, back to balance, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, it's, you gotta, you have to, you have to start with, in all of these conversations, to start with the what and the why, instead of starting with the how. I mean, somebody's, somebody bringing you a how of, of uh, getting something done is a big red flag. Hang on, let me take a step back because you're, that, that requester is operating in likely a, a silo or a vacuum. Um, uh, to the rest of what's going on. And if you can, if you can flatten that out, you get to better end results and better experiences 
than if you start by just going, yeah, I can get it done. I have 10,000 things on my to-do list. I can get 15 of them done today as long as I don't question why um, <laughs> I do it. But then all, all we get out of that is um, uh, what I've affectionately called a, a meatloaf implementation um, in your tech stack, right? Because it's just all sorts of things um, everywhere. And um, I've never really had a really good one of those. So why don't we shift into talking about customer experience, right? We've been slowly moving toward digital over the past couple of decades, frankly, but that pace over the last couple of years has increased significantly. So Kevin, with sales being primarily virtual, um, how do they make connections that count? With their prospects? With their prospects, right? With everybody going into this virtual environment, um, both in um, from a systems view as well as from a, you know, kind of an interpersonal yeah, I think that's the $29 million question is, is how do you do that? Because I think a lot of us are still struggling with that. And it's there's a couple of approaches that I've seen where the reaction has been, well, we probably have just had hunters and farmers in our organization. We may have a defined account list or we may be very geographic based in our territories. And people throw that up against the wall and say, let's reconfigure that. And let's let's reconfigure who our target prospects are and who's gonna call on them. No longer is it bound by the geography that you sit in, right? Or maybe even um, the, the accounts close to you. Um, and so you're seeing people address that just by changing how they, you know, how they define territories and what they carry. And then you're seeing other folks that are breaking up the sales roles into micro roles. Um, you're seeing more SDR, BDR roles, and you're seeing us take what would have been those two, you know, field and inside roles. Now that everybody's inside, um, we're having to come up with some new motions for our salespeople to, to go through. So I think it really starts in looking at a blank sheet of paper and saying, what's our market? Let's not think about geography. Let's not necessarily think about industry as much. Um, and let's let's see how do we need to map our um, seller journey to the buyer journey that's really there. Uh, and then from there, it's OK, it's all the practical, tactical stuff. How do I find those people? How do I get a good data set of those people? How do I automate the touches with those people and um, and then keep everybody informed about that? So that's a high level answer. Um, yeah. but, um, I think a lot of people are still really trying to figure that out. And um, the technology has shifted some. I mean, obviously, we have things like these meeting platforms like we're meeting on today that have enabled us as a crutch throughout all of this. But I think a lot of people are living, they're burning the relationship capital that they built up in 2018, 2019, 2020. And, and now we're, we're searching for how, how do we sell differently? And um, the tools that have been built were built for those older sales models. And so some of them, that especially those that were designed for inside salespeople that are now being adopted by field salespeople who are calling from their house, that's, that's, a nice, that's a nice new use of that tool. I don't know that there have been completely new tools developed um, for this new environment that we're in. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Yeah, great point. One th one thing that I heard you say in the past was, um, you know, fast eats slow, right? Mm -hmm. um, Christy, how does technology keep up with that, right? Because um, what we've talked about is kind of the high level, what we're going for, what we need to do. How can we be fast so that we're not eaten by slow? But technology has to play a key role there. So how, how do we keep up with that? I think as the admin, it's really a focus on iterating, right? We talked a little bit about uh, paralysis, and I definitely think, um, you know, with the analysis paralysis, it's easy to want the best answer all the time. But um, with Salesforce, there's usually like three different ways you can do the same thing um, just with, uh, you know, uh, without even adding in external factors, mm -hmm. right? So, um, uh, you know, Kevin mentioned kind of um, prototyping and really just trying to iterate and looking at a, a phased approach, right, of, you know, kind of the, the minimum the viable product you can start with to, again, to test out these ideas and to um, as we're, you know, trying these new things, if there's a new piece you need to track, I need to figure out a, an easy way to add it and an easy way for you to complete it, right? To make sure that it's not just a field buried on a page that no one's ever going to access, right? So mm -hmm. thinking about that, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about of, you know, the more advanced admin piece. It's not just here, I bought this, make it work, right? It's uh, thinking about how users are going to use it, how you need to report on it, 
um, how you want to uh, collect that information, if it's automated, manual, at what point you're expecting to see it, um, you know, how can you reinforce and really add it into that process? And, and it really is um, not, again, beyond just that order taking piece, it's really thinking about how these things fit in holistically to that experience. Um, we used to call it Sabwa Salesforce admin by walking around, um, but you, you've got to be a lot more um, intentional about that when you're working right. remotely, right? Whether it's just literally setting up Zoom sessions for me to watch my salesperson create a record, right? Or even, you know, I, I went to my first conference uh, the, for, for the year um, and, and sitting next to my salesperson at the booth and, and seeing her work in Salesforce, right? And that right. really, um, th the way that I think people are going to do things is uh, honestly, rarely the way they actually figure out how to do them. So um, being able to kind of just get something started and and see how it goes and, and make sure you build in those feedback loops so that you understand if you need to pivot uh, for the next iteration. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, um, you know, if there are three um, blessed ways of doing something in Salesforce, there are 10,000 other ways um, of doing it there as well, right? Um, so, you know, what, what I'm hearing here is, um, you know, we, we have to we have to just be conscious of the the environment that we're in right now, so that we can be fast, so that we don't get eaten alive by folks that have figured out that have figured that out, that haven't burned all of their relationship capital from before when they were actually able to have meals with a customer, you know, <laughs> if you can imagine, um, or anything right along those lines. And, you know, you know. It, what really resonates with me is the um, is the MVP side of things and the um, the iteration and making sure that you're getting it right as you move along instead of making right it, it's it is it's overlaying the kind of sprint based approach to or the agile based approach to uh, to development into this um, environment you know kind of um, as a as a multiple which leans into a question that came in um, uh, from the comments which are. Um, you know what are what are some of the um, the favorite tools that you guys have seen and, and used? And I'll I'll kick it off, and I'm going to be selfish and say that Squid's one of my favorites, um, <laughs> right? And um, so I'm going to I'm going to take that meatball and I'm going to use it um, because it leans right into that MVP and that iteration, right? Being able to declaratively create in small baby steps what you're hearing from the users and what problem they're trying to solve and being able to iterate on that over time, we have found to be extraordinarily powerful in our in our customer base. But I'll stop taking that um, that obvious one uh, away and, um, and pass it to you, Kevin, on what uh, what some of your favorite tools are. Yeah, so I'm going to, I do this often, I'm going to back up a little bit. One of the things that we need to remember is why are we doing this? So when I talk about favorites, here's the three things that I think we need to accomplish in sales ops or rev ops. We need to drive for things that are that help us be more actively managed, where we can get more disciplined in our processes on purpose all the time. If we just do that, though, we're seen as sales prevention, right? So it can't just be mm -hmm. all about being actively managed. Right. We have to also keep in mind we need to be easy to sell for. So what are those tools that are going to you know, uh, help the, the sales process not only be more efficient, be frankly fun. If we can make it fun, that's great. We need to be easy to sell for. Why? Because finding new people is hard. Keeping the people that we have is, is sometimes difficult as well. And by the way, it's really expensive. So if we can make our organization a place where people want to come because they know they've got the backing, the training, the resources for leads, they've got these great systems to help them run their corner of the business, and help them be successful, then we're doing well. And then the third is every sales team that's really successful has a high performance culture. And it's not about the tools, it's not about the data or the strategy, it's about the culture. So what I challenge people to do is look at the sales stack that you have today or the project you've got in motion and put a little mark next to each of those three. What am I doing to be more actively managed does that also have an easy to sell for component that I'm addressing? And by the way, how's this gonna impact my culture in a positive way? Right. So those are the three principles for, that we need to use to like evaluate what we're doing. But when we look at the specific tools, like, it depends on the size of your company and where you are. But I'm going to go by a couple of categories. Category data. Where am I getting good data from? The world there has changed a lot. Zoom Info is my favorite place to go get data. Since they bought Discover Org, they have a very good data set for North America and growing and better in Europe and Asia. OK, so I like Zoom Info for data. If we're talking about um, reporting, 
um, reporting specifically on Salesforce objects or cross object reporting um, and having a library of reports that are not just, and it's not just a toolbox. I like Insight Squared. Um, Insight Squared plugs right in, you get instant good information, and then you can be on your toes asking your teams, okay, here are the 15 reports for, for determining success of your team. What's not here instead of mm -hmm. always being reactive. And it does that hard stuff like cross object reporting super well. By the way, they just got bought by Mediafly today. Um, it goes back to our other discussion. Um, we look at things like um, sales performance management, right? In looking at how we're performing and paying people and rolling out plans, that's a hard and difficult thing that we don't all get to. Sometimes it still gets stuck in Excel. Yep. There are tools there that have really changed. Um, some of them have kept up with the times, like Verisent. Verisent has really kept up with the times and they're a favorite by really big companies. You look at companies that are coming to this market in North America, like Performio, they have a great package. And then you've got newcomers like Spiff um, that have a really cool interface that it, it just works, right? So there's some great stuff in the SPM space. And then when you look at, um, you look at forecasts, Clary is a great tool for forecasts. People AI is a decent tool for forecasts as well, where they've got that automated flow from one level to the next, but they give you the, the programmatic or statistical forecast vectors too. Um, those are great tools. Um, and, um, oh, and then activity management. So one of the biggest things that I've seen lately is before 2020 hit, we were all starting to look at sales enablement software, the category of sales enablement software, which is some mm -hmm. of the rebranded training stuff. Some of it was rebranded and expanded CMS software. Um, and some of those great tools there, I like, I like uh, Seismic in that space, but a lot of people were being told, hey, I've got to get my sales team more effective. So let's pause on the enablement stuff and let's just get more emails and sequences and that sort of stuff out there. And I think the leaders there are clearly outreach and sales loft. Zant is probably a, a, a fast running third mm -hmm. area. So that's my quick run. Yeah, I, I was I was sitting back, I'm listening to all these great suggestions and going, I should have known when I asked the sales ops guy um, about some tools that we were going to get a very complete answer. And that was thanks so much for that, Kevin. Yeah, there's a lot. We're working on a sales tech directory and a sales stack um, recommendation tool as well. So if you want to know when that comes out, come over to sopsa.org and um, sign up for our newsletter because we're, we're going to be getting that stuff out here very soon. Uh, perfect. Perfect. That's great. I'm sure the audience will love that. Christy, how about you? A couple from your side. I mean, I'm biased towards Sears Insight, obviously, but you already stole that game with Squid. I think uh, one thing that, you know, kind of resonated with what, what Kevin was just saying is a lot of times there's multiple players. And so I think um, I found that in looking for a new e-signature proposal tool. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's easy to go there. There's some um, heavy hitters, right? There's some well-known options, um, but we ended up going with Proposify, which I think was a great um, option that's a little bit smaller of a company, right? I think they're kind of looking at proposals a little bit differently. It's an act active proposal you can interact with. So you can let people add on training, um, you know, mm -hmm. add extra seats um, and just connect that right back into Salesforce, right? And it, it connects to other tools as well. So it was an interesting um, look at, you know, evaluating a few different tools, some of the more well-known, some, and, and Proposify was new to me in searching for for uh, recommendations and, and tools of others that I engage with in the community. So um, yeah, that's kind of the, the new one that we added into our stack this year. Yep. And I, I just noticed, unfortunately, we clobbered all the other logos um, on our back hour, background here. So I'm, I'm, I'm super sorry about that. We, that's, a, uh, that's a mess. But um, I wanted to, uh, wanted to transition into where do we go from here? Like, how do we advise folks what, are, what they should be looking at? So kind of looking at this as a New Year's resolution time. Kevin, you've worked with hundreds of sales ops teams, right? You talked earlier about um, you know, operating at peak efficiency. How do you know when you're there? Right. How does an organization know as people are building up to that through the remainder of this year and going into next year? Yeah, you know, you're operating at peak of peak performance whenever you're consistently outperforming your peers. Right. When, when you have a, a, a sales machine that continues to set, set goals and, and produce. And mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things that really helps you there is having real clarity about it, what it is that we're going to do. Right. Um, I think especially in the times that we've lived through in the last 18 to 24 months, having a sales strategy that has very specific things you're going to accomplish each half and everybody in the company knows what they have to do today to contribute to making those objectives successful. And I'm not talking about, well, we need to grow our revenues by 10% this year and our renewals by six. Right. That's an outcome. Like, okay, what are the objectives? What are the things that we're going to go land five new lighthouse accounts in the banking space? That's going to help us. Or we're going to, you know, um, take existing customers that have started with this product and we're going to bring six of them over by the end of the quarter um, into this expanded service, right? And then what are we going to do? What are the activities we have to do to reach those objectives? So, you know, hitting peak performance, I think it's, it's, it's obvious when you're starting to continually outperform and everybody on the team knows how they contribute um, to those objectives and they can tell you, like, what am yep. I doing today that, that, that affects those? Yep. Makes sense. So, uh, Christy, how about you? Like, what do you recommend for admins as they prioritize our to-do lists, um, you know, going into the, the new year? Yeah, I think the key thing is to m it intentionally make space for the not shiny items, right? So um, the the technical debt kind of ideas, uh, specifically around, you know, uh, the idea of sunsetting workflow and process builder and moving to flow, or um, as Salesforce is building out more Slack integration and, you know, potentially migrating things from Chatter to Slack. But even as we talked about earlier, unused fields, right? Um, processes that just don't serve you anymore, whether you kind of dice that up, I've, I've heard object by object, like an object a month, or, um, you know, whatever helps yep. you to focus on uh, making sure you're making room for that in your sprints and really also making room or, or fighting for the tools that you need as an admin to better document and uh, support your org, you know, whether that's maybe you're ready for DevOps now and you've got um, a larger team or growing team and need to um, add some structure there, kind of whatever you need as well as the admin to be able to support both that, um, you know, the, the micro things of the, the little pieces that you need to do and the new things you need to implement and or, mm -hmm. or build, depending on what you decide. Um, but also that macro view of Again, continually making sure that your user experience is where it needs to be. And because um, a lot of times those little wins for your users, I just recently realized that it wasn't easy to make an opportunity from a demo record. So for mm -hmm. me, that's one day's work, right? That's one item that I can you know quickly iterate through. And now my sales team thinks I'm the greatest, right? And so, <laughs> um, it, you know, those things that you can um, continue to deliver as well as thinking about the admin pieces that no one else is probably thinking about that you need to make sure you continue to surface as priorities to fight for the time to address those kind of underlying technical debt items. Yeah, makes makes complete sense, right? A lot of common themes throughout everything that we've talked about today. Um, you know, this, this, this crawl, walk, run, but always keep the end goal in mind and, um, you know, uh, try to be the person that brings sanity to the insanity of what's going on inside your environment. Uh, be the hero to the sales organization, right? Whether, um, you know, no matter what side of it um, that you're on, because in the end of the day, that um, that brings success to customers and that brings success to um, to your organization. So um, super thankful for all the, the insights that were shared here today. And I want to move us on to the um, the raffle winners. Um, for those of you that um, um, that stuck around um, to listen to, to to Christy and to Kevin um, and their, their fantastic insights. So, um, uh, we, we've got uh, we've got folks on the back end that have been um, uh, going through and and giving us what the uh, what those answers are. So I'll start um, without um, without much ado or um, or drum rolls and, and say that um, Justin Baker, thanks so much for for being here today. Got a smart whiteboard for you, uh, Kevin. Can you take the next one on the list? It looks like Kristen Hill is now the proud owner of an Amazon gift card that she needs to use for herself for Christmas. That 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 that's what I say. So that's, congratulations. That, that that is a that's a prediction and great advice um, for what to do with that one. That's fantastic, Christy. How about our next one? We've got some Apple AirPods for Gregory Burns. Fantastic, and I will um, I'll I'll bring us in for a for a landing with our fourth one. 
Um, Edith Roth, you are the um, soon to be proud owner of a snack magic gift box uh, that we'll put together and, uh, and get off. And, and you don't uh, have to share the snacks either if you don't yeah, want to. Yeah, I want to know what that is. That sounds really good. <laughs> right, exactly. And um, it is entirely okay when you get a gift uh, in something like this to be selfish uh, and use it, uh, use it entirely for yourself. Um, well, I hope everybody's had a good time. A very informative um, uh, uh, venue for me today. Christy and Kevin, thanks so much for uh, uh, taking the time to come on and, um, and share your, your wisdom and your guidance on things that have been happening in the, in the ops and the app space. Um, and more importantly, um, what we're predicting for, um, for the, the coming future. I hope everybody has a wonderful, safe uh, holiday season uh, with family and friends. Um, and thanks for your time. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sean. Good to see you, Christy. Mm -hmm.